Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing well. Doing Good. Well. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. Okay. Here we go. All right. So we're going to start off with a word practice that has the ow sound and aw sound. Here we go. House caught, mouse crawl, louse prawn, pounce drawn, cloud fawn, loud dawn, doubt brawl, clout fraught, spout scrawl, trout drawl, crowd claw, plow raw, stout pawn, sound jaw, mound straw, Round, sprawl, couch, shawl, pouch, lawn. All right, let's do some common phrases. Here we go. Whether he remembers, whether he says, whether he shall, whether he should, whether he thinks, whether he understands, whether he wanted, whether he wants, whether he was, whether he will, whether he will go, whether he would, whether I am, whether I believe, whether I believed, whether I can, whether I cannot, whether I could, whether I ever, whether I felt, whether I feel, whether I had, whether I have, whether I have been, whether I have had, whether I recall, whether I recalled, whether I recollect, whether I recollected, whether I remember, whether I remembered, whether I say, whether I shall, whether I should, whether I understand, whether I want, whether I wanted, whether I was, whether I will, whether I would, whether or not, whether or not he believed, whether or not he believes, whether or not he can, whether or not he could, whether or not he feels, whether or not he felt, whether or not he had, whether or not he recalled, whether or not he recalls. All right. Now, this is going to be a word practice drill. It's called the word jumble drill. So you have to write what you hear because all, it doesn't all make sense. So this happens a lot. So it's, like, it's kind of like one of those drills. Okay, just trust what they say. Here you go. Or she shouldn't, but she did anyway. Anyhow, he knew about the whole thing. He asked her and she said, no, never. So he went to another girl and asked if she wouldn't dare try it with them and the others. But she just didn't do those things. What is it I'm trying to say here? What it might be is this. Is this what I'm trying to say? Me with my big mouth. My mouth mumbles much too much. She does come between the two of them far too often. And that could be why she and he weren't there for very long. Perhaps it was because of the fact or facts that when they, or whether they came face to face in a one-on-one -on -one confrontation, there would be a lot of you and I and mine and yours and his and hers and some and yours and ours, or could be, but then again could not be, could be, would want, will the, in it, did this, in some, would the, in this, does it, won't they? Haven't we? Had you? Have we? He doesn't. At the could be. There should. Why we should have. This isn't. When had. For it. From and for. The actual reason why we should have did it this particular way. I almost always forget to practice. From and. From against each other. And also. And any. And always. And he. And she. And when. And why. And his. And has. And this. And that. And to. And on and off, and of, and the answer as compared to just that or was that about it. All right. Now, I've got some briefs I'm going to give you, and then I'll give you the sentences. Okay, again, if you have any question about any of the briefs, let me know. So we have mourn, more than, newspaper, on or about, other than, pressure, promise, prosecute, prosecution, prosecutor, telephone, treatment, will you please, would you please, 
yes or no, are you able, associate, association, black and blue, brother-in-law, burden of proof, daughter-in-law, defendant's exhibit, diagram, do you recognize, employee, employee, employer, employment, enable, father-in-law, I didn't believe, I didn't do, I didn't feel, I didn't get, I didn't go, I didn't know, I didn't mean, I didn't say, I didn't see, I didn't understand, in and out. Okay, so just let me know if you have any questions about those. Here are your sentences. All right. We can do more than that. All of his friends came to mourn him. The newspaper was wet. The incident was on or about the fifth. Other than that, I don't know. To relieve the pressure, you must calm down. I promise I won't go. We are going to prosecute. They all came to witness the prosecution. He loved his job as a prosecutor. I need to make a telephone call. This is inhumane treatment. Will you please shut up? Would you please go away? Do you like him? Yes or no? Are you able to walk? Jack is my associate. We work in association with Mac. I saw black and blue marks. Mike is her brother-in-law. We need the burden of proof. I have one daughter-in-law. May I enter defendant's exhibit five? The diagram shows he hit her. Do you recognize anyone in here? I will employ that idea. I was an employee of that firm. I did not like my employer. Joe is seeking employment there. This will enable you to talk and walk. My father-in-law is George. I didn't believe him either. I didn't do the dishes. I didn't feel it was true. I didn't get any gifts. I didn't go because I was tired. I didn't know you worked there. I didn't mean to offend you. I didn't say that. I didn't see that dog. I didn't understand the question. This is the in and out of the case. All right, now this is going to be a number drill. Some of the biggest cities in the world with their population. Okay. All right, I got something in my eye. All right, here we go. Moscow. 10,452,000 Russia. Mexico City, 8,609,347 Mexico. Tokyo, 8,535,792 Japan. Jakarta, 9,576,788 Indonesia. New York City, 10,250,567 United States. Beijing, 7,699,297 China. London, 6,581,052 United Kingdom. Hong Kong, 7,206,000 Hong Kong. Bangkok, 6,704,000, Thailand. Lahore, 6,570,000, Pakistan. Baghdad, 5,258,383, Iraq. Singapore, 4,436,000, Singapore. Santiago, 4,668,000, 473, Chile. Alexandria, 3,247,414, Egypt. Los Angeles, 5,849,378, United States. Yokohama, 3,602,758, Japan. All right. Now let's do some names and addresses. There we go. <clears throat> Dorothy E. Nelson, N-E-L-S-O-N, 4818 South 19th Street, 
Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 53221. Sherry I. Stewart, S-T-E-W-A-R-T, 1010 North Dewey Street, Oak, Michigan, 48967. Loretta G. Flowers, F-L-O-W-E-R-S, 3495 Sarah Lane, Idaho Falls, Idaho, 83401. Teresa A. Klein, C-L-I-N-E, 1210 Renal Hall, University of Iowa, Iowa City, Iowa, 52242. L.R. Becker, B-E-C-K-E-R, 1210 Oh, I'm sorry, let me say that again. L.R. Becker, Johnson Wax Company, Racine, Wisconsin, 53403. Mr. Rob L. Leth, L-A-T-H, International Rehab Associates, 1112 University Road, Spokane, Washington, 99206. Mr. Edward A. Reseski, R-E-C-E-S-K-I, P.O. Box 976, 3820 Locust Walk, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, 19104. Ms. Gail E. Irwin, I-R-W-I-N, 181 Walnut Street, Letonia, Ohio, 45431. Carolyn M. Nicely, N-I-C-E-L-Y, 936 Vine Avenue, Buena Vista, Virginia, 24516. Right. I've got a vehicle description drill for you with uh, some license plate numbers as well. Okay, here we go. 2011 Black Jaguar XJ6, license number Z43QWE. 2014 Blue Ford Mustang, license number. 4BCR315. 2015 White Ford Pickup, license number 5FH390. 2002 Toyota Camry, license number 2WLT681. 2007 Honda Civic, license number 4RHS869. And I didn't tell you this, you probably already know this, but license plate is just L, initial L, final P. License plate number is initial L, final NLT, or you can do initial L, final NLT with the flag. Um, you know, e either one works. I don't flag it, but I know some people do, okay? Okay, here we go. Uh, 1999, Kia, White, license plate number 7JD057. 1989, Silver Plymouth Voyager, license number 2VZX341. 2009, Black Lexus SC300, license number ITWA431. 2000, Dark Gray Acura Legend, license number 2NOV212. 1990, Maroon Ford Probe, license number 3JTH931. 2008, Blue Saturn SLI, license number 5FWT950. 2013, Beige Toyota Corolla, license number 3NKT351. There's more, but I'll stop there and we'll finish these next week. Okay. All right, now I've got some car accident briefs. Again, if there's anything that you wanna know, let me know, okay? All right, here we go. Scene of the accident, driveway, highway, roadway, stop sign, skid mark, ambulance, speed limit, passenger, window, Vehicle, motorcycle, stoplight, street light, red light, green light, yellow light, brake light, flashing light, traffic light, seat belt, motorcycle, before the accident, after the accident, intersection, parking lot, rear view mirror, side view mirror, SUV, freeway, 
accident, windshield, traffic, seatbelt, impact, after the accident, after the impact, point of impact, before the impact, collision, southbound, westbound, northbound, eastbound. You have any questions on those? You know all those? No? Here, let me see. Okay. I am. I'm good. Yeah, you're good. I think there, wait, let me go back. There was one. I don't brief all of those, but I'm good with what I do. So, okay, yeah. yes. but um, actually, what was the one? What's the brief for window? I've never briefed oh, that. That's W A O. Woo. Window. Oh, I don't know if that'll work. Yes. I don't think of it like that. I don't know. And that's okay. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go through these and you stop me if there's one you want to know, okay? It'll take me okay. one minute. Okay. Scene of, scene of the accident, uh, skid mark, ambulance, passenger, window, vehicle, motorcycle, before the accident, after the accident, intersection, parking lot, rear view mirror, side view mirror, SUV, freeway, accident, windshield, traffic, driveway, highway, roadway, speed limit, stop sign, stop light, street light, red light, green light, yellow light, brake light, flashing light, traffic light, seat belt, impact, point of impact, after the impact, before the impact, collision, and then there's southbound, westbound, northbound, eastbound. Okay, I'll, I'll take the one for motorcycle because that's like yeah that's a good four, point. that's four strokes or whatever yes oh, well that's for one me. of my favorites moik m-o-i-k that makes sense to me okay motorcycle cool yeah that's i love that one. Oh, it's in my dictionary ah yay <laughs> i okay. guess i got that one somewhere along the line that's good okay moik thank you you're welcome all right so now I've got uh, some sentences that have different figures in them. Okay, here we go. I wouldn't do that if I were you. Why'd he do it if he knew he'd get caught? Will he give you the $7,543 by Friday? Meet me at 10 o'clock a.m. at 4th and Main. He owes me $154 and he'd better pay. Jonathan hasn't paid the $550. Marilyn won't give him the $700. $500 is what Anthony owes Alexandria. Have you been to the cafe on 65th Street? Give David the $950 for the ring. Sheila will share the silver coins with Al, which are worth $1,000. Clyde Clayton will wear the $1,000 silver suit. Sarah Sue Sorensen paid the $300 bill. Let's have lunch at B's on 3rd Avenue and have a $5 drink. Jamal Terrence will pay $90.54. She said she was there at 9.45 p.m. exactly. Mar Marilena refused to pay the $689 tab. Dwayne gave her the bill for $543.31. 167th Street and Sepulveda is flooded. Elizabeth and Michael each paid $36. Rick Fox will contribute $4,000 to the charity. Fred Ferguson flew to Florida for $279. Did you know he paid $167 round trip? They will pay the gas bill of $123.40 today. Isabel Eastman will donate $2,500. The 10th Street off-ramp is closed until 7 p.m. today. All right. <clears throat> I've got one last drill, and then we're going to go on to literary. Okay, this is the pronoun drill, one of my favorites. 
I'm just dating this. All right, here we go. Let me get my watch. I'll read this at 200. <clears throat> When writing on this machine, I used to shadow when I attempted to write pronouns such as I, you, and T. I sometimes misstroked when I wrote the words this and that, and when and what, and who and were, and where and which, and there, and it is, and it's, and what is, and what's. When I read these notes after writing this material at a push speed, I often found I had you for he or he for I, or that I often had I when that transcript was speaking of he or you. Sometimes at these push speeds I found when I was sure I had hit that, it turned out that that was this. Sometimes my this was that or even an occasional there. It was easy to stroke it is instead of its. When you and I push, we may find that we have written it is for its and its for it is. It is not quite so easy to confuse it has for the word its or its for the word it has. What, when, who, and which are just a shadow away from each other. So it is easy when what you heard as a what to have a when or who in the notes or when what I heard as a who to have a what or when in my notes or when what he heard as a when to have a who or what in the notes. We have paid close attention to the differences in the strokes between who is and whose. And who's to say when you heard the word I, you might have stroked the word you or he. It was easy when what you heard as he to have stroked the word I for you. What was easy for you to do was to hear you and to have stroked I or he. I don't know about you, but what I thought when I had a you in my notes and I fit better was that I might have confused my I and you. Did you find that was the case with you too? That was what I found when there was a he in my notes and I or you fit better. I thought there was something wrong there and that was when I decided to straighten out which stroke is which word. Now when what I hear is a you, I get the you in my notes, not an I or a he. I practice these pronouns because I tended to shadow my notes when I push my speed. I am happy and I am sure you are happy too now that we write. What we write is what we hear, such as you for you, I for I, this for this, that for that, who, what, when, where, how, and why for who, what, when, where, how, and why. That's my favorite drill. <laughs> the pronoun drill, that's what that's called. All right, let's do some, I put my literary down here. I need to do that, sorry. Okay, let's get started with our literary. All right, so I'm gonna read you just a funny little fact. Again, I'm, I'll read this at 200, it's not very long. It's called Taking a Leap, fun fact. In the middle of the night on September 2013, four New York residents slipped through a hole in a fence surrounding the New World Trade Center complex and made it inside past the round the clock security team. Then they climbed to the top of the 104 story building, which wasn't yet open to the public. And while one of them kept watch, three parachuted off the edge. They would have gotten away with it too, had a surveillance camera not caught video of the whole thing. <laughs> Crazy, those people that do that stuff. All right, now this is called Something for Everyone. This is from the NCRA magazine, and it says, how, how shall they hear? Okay, here we go. Have you ever thought of honoring the people you provide cart or captioning for on a Sunday morning and letting them know how special they are to your church? And while you are doing so, why not give the congregation a hint of what it would be like to have a hearing loss? On a very special Sunday morning on October 14, 2017, in the two morning services, our church honored the people we captioned for and in doing so, brought to the attention of the congregation how difficult it truly is for the people with a hearing loss. The church service that morning started out pretty much in the usual way. Then after the worship songs, our pastor began explaining to everyone how this particular Sunday morning we were going to transition 
from our well-known hearing world into a world that most of us did not know very much about. A video began playing as we heard Pastor Dan say, catch this video, what is it like to be in a deaf or hard of hearing world? Let me back up a bit. In the weeks leading up to this church service, Martin Gardner, our technical person, with the help of John Ford, one of the people we captioned for, put together a video clip that was short and to the point, and what an effect it had. When we first thought about how to make the clip, we decided to use a song, and we wondered about which song. We thought back to the previous Easter play our church had put on, Eyes on Faith. Father Mark Curtis, also known as Canada's singing priest, had sung a song, You Thought of Us. As we thought about us, we realized this song would be perfect. <clears throat> so we got Father Mark's permission and blessing, and by editing parts of the song, we were able to convey a very meaningful message in two minutes. Once we chose the song, we then needed to figure out the audio. So we consulted with John Corwright, who has a profound hearing loss and is considered deaf, and his wife, Kathy, who has a medium hearing loss and is considered hard of hearing. We asked for their advice because we really had no clue as to how the clip should sound. For years, John and Kathy have wanted to put together a video that demonstrated hearing loss. They very patiently explained that the goal of the video was so that the audience can hear the sound but not understand many or any of the words. They told us that it is usually very difficult to enable people to understand what a person with hearing loss actually hears. When making the video, you don't ever want complete silence because that is not really what deafness is like, says John. He says that so many people think that by simply turning up a volume, a person with a hearing loss will hear what is being said. Sometimes yes, but most of the time turning up the volume does not help. Kathy told us that deafness is similar to hearing a little something. Perhaps you can identify whether the speaker is a male or a female, but you just can't for the life of you figure out what is being said. John said that he envisioned the hearing loss simulation starting at normal audio and then having modified the sound. He said we should remove enough of the consonants to make speech confusing, and after another few moments, the captions could come on so everyone could see the words. So Martin started working on the video. He explains, since the goal of the video was to give our hearing audience a sense of what it was like to be hard of hearing, we needed to do some creative editing to pull it off effectively. We used Adobe Premiere Pro, but you can use whatever editing software you have available. First off, we cut the middle person of the song or the middle portion of the song entirely out so that we could have a nice beginning and an end to our video. By removing a couple of the choruses, we received a short two minute music video. We split the video into four main parts, about 30 seconds each. In the beginning, the sound was normal and the second quarter was where we gave our audience the first sense of hearing loss by cutting up the audio a little chunk at first and longer chunks after that. We applied high pass and low pass audio effects to the sound and adjust the intens intensity more and more as the video continued to play with some portions remaining unaffected. By doing this, we let the audience hear the difference between normal sound and manipulated sound, which gave the people the feeling that something was wrong, as well as a sense of frustration of being able to hear only portions of the song. <clears throat> By the third quarter of the video, the audio effect was at full force, allowing our audience to only be able to hear a strong bass boom every few seconds, but no sense of knowing if it was a voice or music sound. At this point, all of the people who were watching were hard of hearing and needed something to make sense of what they were even watching and listening to. So after hearing this drone for a while, we began putting the captions up on the screen so that the audience could again, once again, follow along with the music video. The captions provided them with the words that the singer was projecting and gave them a sense of unity with each other and the singer, all connecting in the moment of the song. The clip turned out to be even more effective than we had originally hoped for. John still tells the story that when he first heard it, he reached to adjust his hearing aid before realizing the video was a hearing simulation. We knew that when it was exactly, let me say that again, we knew then that it was exactly what we needed. So back to the church service. 
As soon as the video finished playing, we asked John to speak to the congregation. That's an interesting little video clip he started off. We created a hearing loss for each one of you that have normal hearing, just a minor loss. We wanted you to know why people with hearing loss give up going to church. Then John explained, they can hear it, but they can't make it out. Over half a million Canadians have a hearing loss like this video displayed. Where are they? Many are not in our churches because their need is not being met. John continued, look at the last line of that song. You thought of us, how important that is. Who is us? Every one of us, hearing and non-hearing alike. How can we help? Put godly compassion into action by meeting real needs of the people. One suggestion was to put cart or captioning in our churches. The number of people with hearing disabilities has grown dramatically during the past 10 years. In Canada, it won't be long before almost 25% of our population will be 65 years old or older. Furthermore, one third of those individuals have a hearing loss and their hearing loss increases with age. Following John's talk, the church service continued with several people whom we captioned for giving their stories of what it is like either to have a loss of hearing or to have someone in their family who is deaf. As the Reverend then spoke to the congregation, he quoted Romans 10, 14, how then can they all, or how can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? Yes, that Sunday had something for everyone. For the hearing people, we transported them into a world from which they have learned a lot. And the dear people we captioned for, well, we expressed how much we love, admire, and respect each one of them. And it says, um, contributing editor, Pat Gardner is from Milton, Orlando, Canada. So, and she provides cart and captioning for churches. So pretty cool. I thought that was a neat article. All right, let's move into jury charge. I'm gonna read, I'll read this one at a uh, 225, okay? All right, here we go. Members of the jury, plaintiffs have the burden of proving damages by a preponderance of the evidence. Damages means the amount of money which will reasonably and fairly compensate the plaintiffs for any injury you find was caused by the defendant. Your award must be based upon the evidence and not upon speculation, guesswork, or conjecture. Plaintiffs in this action sued to recover damages for the deaths of Mary Smith and Jack Smith Sr. If you decide for the plaintiffs on the question of liability and determining the amount of damages they are entitled to recover, you may consider the following items. One, loss of love and affection, including loss of society, companionship, comfort, consortium, or protection by Mary Smith and Jack Smith Sr. to plaintiffs Jack Smith Jr. and Karen Smith. Two, the loss of attention, advice, or counsel of Mary Smith and Jack Smith, Sr. to plaintiffs Jack Smith, Sr. and Karen Smith. Three, loss of parental care, training, guidance, or education by Mary Smith and Jack Smith, Sr. to plaintiffs Jack Smith, Jr. and Karen Smith. Four, Mary Smith and Jack Smith's reasonable burial expenses. And five, physical and mental pain and suffering by Mary Smith and Jack Smith, Sr. prior to their deaths. <clears throat> And consortium just means <clears throat> like affection. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. Um, let's see. How are we doing on time? Yeah, let's get on with our Q&A. All right. So um, let's see. Which one do I want to start? I'll start with this one. Um, okay. So I'm going to start the first one at 180, but it, it is um, an expert witness. He's a geologist. So it is a little bit more... Uh, challenging. So we'll read this one at 180. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Here we go. State and spell your name, please. My name is Brian R. Rogers, R-O-G-E-R-S. Thank you. Go ahead, counsel. Thank you. Where do you live? I live in Butte, Montana. What is your occupation? I am a geologist and civil engineer and a land surveyor. Are you a graduate of any educational institution? Yes, Montana State University, and I have a master in the study of mines. 
And when you say a geologist, do you mean your major was in geology? Yes, I have a Bachelor of Science degree in geological engineering. Okay, the study of geology, does that or does that not include a study of the behavior of subsurface waters? Yes, it does. You have been present this morning while the examination was going on? Yes, I have. Have you heard the testimony? Yes, I have. Have you any acquaintance with any other part of the area under examination here this morning? Yes, the ditch that is known as drag line ditch number one, the upper one quarter mile of that ditch I examined rather thoroughly. At what time was that? That was on November, November of 2013. What was the nature of your observation? Well, we ran a profile from the bottom of the beginning of this drag line ditch at approximately right angles to the direction of the valley to Red Burke Creek. Let me say that again, Red Burke Creek. Why did you do that? To determine the difference in elevation between the bottom of the drag line ditch and the bottom of the stream at that point. With what result? The bottom of the drag line ditch was four and a half feet lower than the bottom of the stream. Okay, what is the nature of the terrain between the dragline ditch at the point you mentioned and the Red Bird Creek at the point you mentioned? Well, it was almost level. It was a swampy, hummocky plain from the ground surface at the head of the ditch to the creek. Did you make any examination as to the nature of the soil? I examined the banks of the dragline ditch and we drove stakes and pins into the ground on the way to the creek. What did you find to be the character of the soil? The surface of the soil is a peaty material and underneath is a clay band underlined by a deposit of stream gravel. Okay, the peat cap or covering tells us whether that supports the vegetation. Yes, it does. And as to the character, the type of material below the clay, what have you to say about that as to its porosity? Well, it's a very porous or porous gravel. Okay, would the water, if water is held in suspension, readily circulate through the stratum? Yes. I want to know if that gravel stratum is porous. Yes, it is. What did you find as to whether the gravel stratum intersected the body of water in the creek? Well, the banks of the creek show the clay and the peat material to be above the gravel in the bottom of the creek. And do I understand that the gravel was in the bottom of the creek? Yes. So that from your knowledge of the behavior of water in that condition, what would naturally happen as between a creek and a ditch, which is four feet or more lower than the creek? Well, there would be a continuous flow of water from the creek to the ditch. Now, did you observe the banks of this ditch? Yes, I did. And what did you see in respect to the presence or absence of any seepage? Well, the head of the ditch is in the form of a hook, and in the part right at the top of the ditch in the hook, the flow from the upstream side was much more predominant than the seepage flow from the downstream side. As the ditch rounded this bend and became parallel with the river, the flow came from both sides of the ditch in equal amounts. Uniformly? Yes. Okay, did you observe with what rapidity the water was seeping filled the ditch? Well, in the first quarter of a mile, there were 100 to 100 inches or 150 inches of water collected in the ditch. Okay, was there any water running into the ditch at the head or did this all accumulate along the way? Oh, it all accumulated. There was no direct contact to the surface water. What have you to say as to the height from the bottom of the ditch wherein the seepage first showed, that is, at the highest level? It was two or three feet above the bottom of the ditch, a foot or foot and a half above the level of the water that was accumulating in the ditch. That the seepage occurred? Yes, there was flow down the banks of the ditch to the top of the water. What have you to say as to whether that was in spots or continuously up and down the ditch where you made the examination? It was practically continuous, the length of the ditch that I examined. I mean the seepage, yes. Now in your study of the behavior of the subsurface water, what have you to say as to the conditions that obtain on the slopes of the hills 
leading into the swamps in question. Well, the groundwater would be moving through the channels available under the surface towards the stream down the slope. And would that or would it not be deposited in the swamps in question? Yes, it would. Would it or would it not show seepage on the surface at times or places? Well, wherever the groundwater table would be cut by the surface of the ground, you would have a spring or a swamp or a marshy spot, water appearing to the surface of the ground. Evidence shows that the south and west margin of the floor of the Red Bird Basin, that hills come down, a hill comes down to the margin of the floor. What have you to say or what would you expect as to whether water would seep out there? Well, there is a gulch that empties out into the big alluvial fan and you would expect to find groundwater per percolating from the rim of those mountains all the way across that fan toward the gulch, toward the lower point, and the direction of it would be with the stream as well as toward the stream, and wherever it would hit the present water table, it would emerge as hillside springs. Okay, what is the fact as to the level of the water table in relation to the level of the surface of the ground? In general, the water table follows the surface of the ground. And do we understand by that, that the water table would be substantially at the same distance below the surface, even though the terrain was on the gradient? Yes, that is right. How did you travel that day that you were up there? We were in a car. And tell us whether you could drive a car on all parts of the land that you examined. Well, it wouldn't have been practical because of the hummocky nature of the ground, but as far as the wetness or bogginess of the ground was concerned, it would have been possible, yes. As I understand it, you are making your explorations largely on the south and west portion of the area? Yes, we were. Now, was there anything, any indications there from which you could determine whether it had previously been a wet area or not? Well, it had the appearance of an old swamp. How long ago it had been a swamp, I couldn't say, but it wasn't swampy at the time that we were there. And what evidence did you have which led you to conclude that it was previously swampy? Well, the character of the surface, the little hummocks and hollows, and the type of vegetation and the general appearance of the ground itself. So hummocks, I looked that up because <clears throat> I really hadn't heard that before. It's just a small area of ground that is slightly higher than the ground around it. And then it also <clears throat> hummocky nature. That's just like a swampy uh, nature. I looked at some of these Alluv alluvial fan, alluvials made of the earth and sand. A gradient is just how steep a road is. Gulch is a narrow valley. So I looked up some of these. So, <clears throat> all right, let's do another one. Let me just date this. All right. All right, I'm gonna read this now at, um, I'll read this at 225, okay. All right, this is gonna be plaintiff. During the course of your investigation, were you contacted by Deputy Carp? Yes, I was. Who was that? He's one of the patrol duties that was working that evening. And when you say that evening, are you referring to December 1st? Yes, ma'am. What did Deputy Carp tell you during your contact with him? That he had stopped a vehicle that Mr. Aztec was in and while searching that vehicle, he recovered a laptop computer that we were looking for. At some point during, during your investigation, did you have Juan Gomez look at the laptop computer that Deputy Carp located in the vehicle in which he located Damien Aztec? It wasn't that evening. I believe it was the next day he came to the station and identified several items that we had recovered during the search warrant. So did you participate in the search warrant of the home of da Damien Aztec? Yes, I did. Where was that? On Matthews Lane off of E Street in the city of Escondido. And what did you find during the course of that search? 
several of the items that had been reported stolen and the original robbery report. Do you recall what items those were? Not off of the top of my head, no. Would it refresh your memory if you looked at your report? Yes, it would. With the court's permission, certainly go ahead. Let me know when your recollection is refreshed. Okay, I'm ready. Is your recollection refreshed? Yes, it is. What did you find during the course of the search warrant at Damien Aztec's residence? There was some stereo equipment, some audio visual, visual controllers. There were some speakers, a car stereo, and some tower speakers as well. When you make contact with Mr. Gomez after the collection of the items found during the search warrant and the collection of the items found during the traffic stop of Mr. Aztec, what items did Mr. Gomez identify as being stolen from him? Well, the laptop computer, the 10 inch HP notebook computer, the car stereo, the tower speakers, and the audio visual controller and some of the home stereo equipment. The location of the home that you searched belonging to Damien Aztec, is that the one located within San Diego County? Yes, ma'am, it is. And also during the course of your investigation, did you have contact with Jeannie Ramirez? Yes, I did. Did that occur on December 2nd of 2011? Yes, in the early morning hours. Okay, during the course of that contact, conduct or contact, contact rather, did you have the opportunity to look at her cell phone? Yes, I did. How did that occur? We were in the interview room. I was conducting an interview and the phone was sitting on the table in front of me. What did you observe when you looked at her phone? Well, there was a text message that had come in from her brother asking her about what had been going on. And I'll object, Your Honor, with regard to identifying who that was from unless the foundation has been laid, sustained. At some point, Detective Smoot, did you observe a text message on Ms. Ramirez's phone? Yes, I did. And what did it say? It was talking about the, you know, the exact wording escapes me. Would it be all right if I looked at my report? Sure. Would you, would that help to refresh your recollection? Yes, it would. Okay, again, with the court's permission? Sure, go ahead. Let me know when and if your recollection is refreshed. Okay, I'm good. Okay, what did the text message say? It was a text message from James Ramirez. I asked her who that was. She told me it was her brother. I text messaged and asked about a guy getting jumped and the text message asked about that. I responded to that text saying, what are you talking about or what do you mean? And then the next text message came back. It was talking about Juan and said James's mother told him what happened. Okay, I have no further questions, Your Honor. Mr. Mendez, thank you. Now, Detective, have you ever heard of Mr. Aztec? Have you heard him speak? No, I haven't. Well, yes, I have heard him speak, but would it be fair to say that he does not have a heavy, thick accent? In my speaking to him in the interview room, it didn't sound like he had a heavy accent, no. Did you confront Mr. Gomez with this, with any of his previous statements to deputy about the suspects wearing black ski masks? Yes, I did. And what did Mr. Gomez tell you in regard to that? Well, that he had lied about it because he was scared for his safety and he didn't want to call the police. Okay, you indicated that when you spoke with Mr. Gomez, he told you some of the, two of the items that were stolen from him was the car stereo and the speakers. Yes, he did. He didn't identify those to you as belonging to Ms. Ramirez. No, when he came to identify the property, he said that was taken from his house. He still took that stuff back. It was released to him. Were you aware that he had previously told Officer Ram that he possessed a stereo and two speakers that belonged to Ms. Ramirez? No, objection, misstates the evidence. Okay, well, sorry, my page stuck together. That will be sustained. Were you aware that Mr. Gomez had a stereo and speakers that belonged to Ms. Ramirez? No, I wasn't aware of that. You indicated that you looked at the phone of Ms. Ramirez after she was in custody? Yes, I did. And there was a text message from her, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And in that text message, it was asking her about a guy that was jumped, yes. And that he had indicated that he had become aware of this from his mother, is that correct? That is correct. And isn't it true that the officers had gone out and spoke to Ms. Ramirez's mother about this incident before that text message? Yes, they had been out at the house. They kind of explained what happened to her and indicated they were looking for Ms. Ramirez, correct? Objection, hearsay, lack of foundation, and misstates the evidence. He's allowed to testify to what other officers said. Well, I think that hearsay goes both ways, doesn't it, counsel? In a Prop 115 preliminary hearing, 
Well, it does. Although he has to be, he has to have a conversation with the same person making the statement to with regard to what was said or a report. That's not accurate. It has to be a statement made to the deputies that are testifying in order for it to come in as hearsay under Prop 115. Really? I thought that exception is farther as long as someone wasn't a reading, wasn't a reader, but I don't really think it matters. So I'm going to overrule the objection. Go ahead and answer if you know. You can always object as to foundation. I wasn't present when that search warrant was served. I was on the other one. I don't know exactly what those officers told her mother. Okay, so with regard to whatever knowledge photo lineups Ms. Ramirez's mother had about the incident, as far as you know, it could have come from the officers that were there and spoke to her, is that correct? It may have come from that, yes, as opposed to Ms. Ramirez speaking to her mother about it. Yeah, anything is possible. Objection calls for speculation. You indicated that. I made an objection. Overruled. He doesn't know. You indicated that. You said earlier in your testimony that that you collected some evidence and the zip ties and a broom handle you actually collected that for dna evidence yes that is correct was that submitted to the lab yes it was did any results come back not that i know of yet nothing further your honor ms brun nothing your honor counsel anything nothing else your honor you can step down thank you call your next witness the people have no further questions none your honor no evidence no your honor Okay, motion. People move that the defendants be held to answer for all crimes chargeable by the evidence. I argue that the evidence is insufficient and specifically, I would point out that the court should view the victim's testimony with some suspicion. Obviously, he has told two different stories at the minimum. With regard to the attackers, he first describes the attackers as males, never mentions anything about a female. He doesn't indicate to the first officer anything about monies that are owed to Ms. Ramirez and the fact that he possesses her stereo and speakers. He, in his testimony, never identified Mr. Aztec as to one of his attackers, but Detective Smoot testifies that he did. So his testimony was that he didn't remember a lot about what had happened. He indicated that he, he did testify that his, he told the officer that his eyes were covered with some type of cloth material, but that he was saying that he could still see. In his second statement, he indicated that he saw my client after the two people came in and attacked him, walked through the room, but he doesn't say that he saw or saw her do anything else. Assuming that the court believes that the, this is true, I think that his testimony should be viewed with a great deal of suspicion, I submit. Okay, so I am suspicious of his testimony because he did give more than one statement, but the guy is obviously in a position that he's very uncooperative, hostile witness, but I don't know that I shouldn't take that into consideration. What his motivation for being scared is, is probably fairly good instincts, is my guess. So I'm going to simply make an order that he be, that both the defendants will be held to answer for all of the crimes alleged and shown at the preliminary hearing and specifically not for the count five or which is the substantive allegation regarding the gang participation and also the enhancements. This case is going to go to Judge Flowers. I don't think we heard any of the evidence, Your Honor, with regard to my client as it relates to count four. I'm not sure. I don't think that she's named on that, okay? All right. It's going to be in Judge Flowers Court two weeks from today on arraignment on the information filed. That's the 22nd of March. Mr. Aztec and Ms. Ramirez, you'll both be appearing at that time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. Now I'm gonna do one last one. I'm gonna read this one at 2.50. Okay, and I even read, I'm doing, yeah, we're good. I read over this so I can read it at 2.50. Um, let's see here, 25, six. Okay, I wanna mark my, Watch in a different color so it stands out. Okay. Six and a half. All righty. This is going to be defense questioning, just Q&A. Okay. You are going to hear Windows. So if you want, use your woo. All right, here we go. 
actually, do you want me to read this once at 225 and then at 250 or just we'll go right to 250? 250, here we go. What time did you arrive at the scene of the accident? I got to the scene of the accident at four o'clock, 4 a.m.? Yes. What did you observe at the scene of the accident? Well, the first thing that I noticed was the skid marks. They had a continuous straight line pattern until they passed through almost the entire intersection. This indicated to me that this vehicle had to have been going at least 80 miles per hour before slamming on his brakes. The position of the second vehicle and the damage to it made it clear that at the point of impact was just below the front passenger window. Did you speak with anyone at the scene? Yes, I did. And whom did you speak to? I spoke to the two drivers of both vehicles. The passenger of the impacted vehicle was taken away in an ambulance after the collision. What did the driver of the impacted vehicle tell you? She told me that they were proceeding down the roadway going no faster than the posted speed limit. As they approached the scene of the accident, the red light for their way of travel changed to a green light. They proceeded through the green light and were impacted on the passenger side. Okay, did she tell you that she had any knowledge of an impact about to occur before the accident? What do you mean? Well, did they hear any car horns, screeching of tires, anything along those lines? She indicated that they had not. And there's no doubt in your mind that the vehicle she was in had the right of way? No, they had the right of way. No stop sign that they ran? No. The light for them wasn't a red light? No. How can you be so sure? The driver of the vehicle number one let it slip that he didn't notice his red light until it was too late to stop. Do you agree with him? Well, the skid marks began after the vehicle was already moving into the intersection. Did he say if the stoplight wasn't working properly? It was working fine. He told me that he was distracted by some flashing lights in the distance. Did he appear injured to you at all? Just minor cuts and bruises. If he were not wearing a seatbelt, he would have ended up on the roadway, however. How'd you do? I don't know, not good. <laughs> That's okay though, we'll keep practicing that. Uh, I was, I just, you know what, I I should have just let it go, man. I, I just kept thinking like, oh, I could really use all those briefs that she did at the beginning of class. <laughs> every single one of them came up almost. <laughs> I know, I noticed that too. I was like, oh, there's speed limit. Oh, there's red light. I know that's what I was thinking and I shouldn't have thought about it. I don't know why I was, I went there in my head. I was just like every single one, but, um, I got, I got parts of it. <laughs> oh, that's okay. That's all right. I have another one. Um, one page that I can, I can read this one at 225 and then do the 200 and then the 180. Okay. Yeah. Now, now 225 is going to sound nice. And I know slow. that's the nice. beauty of it. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Okay. All right. Here we go. We'll do this one. All right. This is a uh, defense too. All right. Oh, let me give, well, I won't give you a word list. So you can just write what you hear. Here we go. The next item is the front door. When did you first notice that? Shortly after we moved in. In what way was it improperly hung? It doesn't close down at the bottom. I am not a carpenter. If a door is improperly hung, does it close at all? Yes. The door hits the frame. The door hits at the frame and you have to take your foot and push the bottom in. Is it a wooden door? Yes. That would be a matter of planing down the door. No, it needs replacing. The door is warped and it is all scratched up on the outside. When did you first notice the scratches? When we were making up the same list. Are you talking about the list in your email on August 12? We made up the list of everything that was wrong with the coach. The next item is that the ceiling of the shower is loose and hanging down. Yes. What do you blame that on? What do you feel causes the roof of the shower to be loose? Improper installation at the factory rather than damage in the moving? Yes, that is what I would put it to. I don't make the coaches. Okay, let me get a, grab a pencil here. All right, now let's do that again at uh, 200, here we go. The next item is the front door. When did you first notice that? Shortly after we moved in. In what way is it improperly hung? It doesn't close down at the bottom. I am not a carpenter. If a door is improperly hung, does it close at all? Yes, the door hits the frame. 
the door hits out the frame and do you have to take your foot and push the bottom in? Is it a wooden door? Yes, that would be a matter of planing down the door. No, it needs replacing. The door is warped and it is all scratched up on the outside. When did you first notice the scratches? When we were making up the same list. Are you talking about the list in your email on August 12? We made up the list of everything that was wrong with the coach. The next item is that the ceiling of the shower is loose and hanging down. Yes. What do you blame that on? What do you feel causes the roof of the shower to be loose? Improper installation at the factory rather than damage in the moving? Yes, that is what I would put it to. I don't make the coaches. Okay, last time at 180, it seemed, that seemed slow reading. Here we go. The next item is the front door. When did you first notice that? Shortly after we moved in. In what way is it improperly hung? It doesn't close down at the bottom. I am not a carpenter. If a door is improperly hung, does it close at all? Yes. The door hits the frame. The door hits at the frame. And do you have to take your foot and push the bottom in? Is it a wooden door? Yes. That would be a matter of planing down the door. No, it needs replacing. The door is warped and it is all scratched up on the outside. When did you first notice the scratches? When we were making up the same list. Are you talking about the list in your email on August 12? We made up the list of everything that was wrong with the coach. The next item is that the ceiling of the shower is loose and hanging down. Yes, what do you blame that on? What do you feel causes the roof of the shower to be loose? Improper installation at the factory rather than damage in the moving? Yes, that is what I would put it to. I don't make the coaches. Did 180 seem really slow? Yeah. Yeah, I know. When I was reading it, it's like, wow, what a difference. <laughs> okay, let me just state this. Okay. All right, so we can each take a Q&A. Okay. You want to take the first one? Sure. Some in my eyes. Okay. <clears throat> Question. The next item is the front door. When did you first notice that? Answer shortly after we moved in. Question. In what way is it improperly hung? Answer. It doesn't close down at the bottom. Question. I am not a carpenter. I have two, but I don't think you said that. <laughs> I am not a carpenter. If a door is improperly hung, does it close at all? Answer yes. Maybe I did say two. It's not on here, but it's kind of weird that you, you struck two, you know? Yeah. I don't know why I did that. Maybe I, did. I don't. I don't think you did. Okay. I don't remember saying two, but. Sometimes I throw in words I don't even realize. All right, let's see. Um, okay, question, the door hits the frame. Answer, the door hits at the frame and you have to take your foot and push the bottom in. Question. It, it's a wooden door, answer yes. See, and I have, is it? Oh, door? do you have, is it? Yeah, I think I have it, a wooden door. I think something happened. I think I stacked my, okay. I don't know what, or it's split or something. I don't know. Okay. okay. Uh, question. That would be a matter of planing down the door. Answer. No, it needs replacing. The door is warped and it is all scratched up on the outside question when did you first notice the scratches answer when we were making up the same list question are you talking about the list in your email 
on August 12th? Answer, we made up the list of everything that was wrong with the coach. Question, the next item is that the ceiling of the shower is loose and hanging down? Answer, yes. Question, what do you blame that on? What do you feel causes the roof of the shower to be loose? Answer, improper installation at the factory. Question, rather than damage in the moving? Answer, yes. That, that was what I would put it to. I don't make the coaches. Yep. Is it, was it that was what I would put it to? No, that is what oh. I would put it to. Okay, I. All right. That's what you have, right? That's what you said. I said that was, I have oh. that was, but. Yeah, that's kind of a weird answer. Yes, that is what I would put it to. I don't make the coaches. Hmm. Kind of, it's kind of a weird answer. Well, that was, that was my 225 take, so good. it wasn't too bad. No, not at all. That's good. Well, we'll keep doing that. I'll uh, keep pulling something for like 250. And then especially if it makes 225 seem slower, you know? It does. Yeah. It, I know. It's crazy because then 200 seem really slow. <laughs> like, wow. <laughs> I know. It is, it's almost like a, 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 a mind trick because then you're like, thinking about writing it perfectly, you know, like getting it real time, you know, perfect. And cause it's so slow, it feels like, but yes. yes. anyways, well, I'll keep doing that. I'll keep pulling something that's just long enough for us to do one take at 250. Cause that seemed to work out well. And it, it was nice that I, I read it before I gave it to you. So it kind of seemed like it helped, you know, make it a little yeah. smoother so I knew what was what we you know what I was gonna have to say so that helped a lot. So, yeah you're you're a good reader. Well, <laughs> you're so I good. I have my off days where it's like oh my gosh like I say words that you know that I don't mean to say it's like dang it you know. No you're you're really good. Oh thank you. You are Thank you. Uh, that's very nice to know because, you know, that's your worst nightmare is for students to go, oh, I can't stand her reading, you know, and everybody has preferences. I've had people tell me before, like, you know, everybody has, they like certain people and not so crazy about others. And, and then like, I remember in school, I liked certain readers and maybe some of my friends liked other ones that I wasn't crazy about. Everybody has their preference, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No. So, anyways, I just try to be clear. So, all right. Well, you have a great weekend. You too. Okay. All right. And Enjoy. I, your, how's the weather out there? Is it good? It's cold. Um, we were supposed to get rain last night. We didn't get any rain, but it's really cold. Like, you know, it's for us, it's cold. I mean, we had to cover our lemon tree because it was going to freeze so that's pretty cold for us you know oh wow yeah yeah so we're supposed to get rain possibly tomorrow but definitely next week like it says three days but you know how that goes we're supposed to get rain last night and never happened so we need it so badly i just feel so bad i mean you know we need it i i know i know i was talking to my sister yesterday who lives out there and she was telling me there was rain in the forecast and she was like saying the same thing. Like, I hope it really happens, you know? Yeah. And so. I don't know if she got rain in the Ventura area, but we didn't get any down here in the San Diego area. So it's kind of a bummer. Yeah. Well, oh. all right. Well, stay warm. <laughs> okay. Yes, I know. I know. It's like I, I'm utilizing, pulling out all my sweaters while I can, because I'll probably just get one week of that and then back to summer again. <laughs> you know, I was still so... Uh funny wearing summer looking clothes when it's winter, but it's like hot outside, you know, man, I never knew what it was like to actually need winter clothes until I moved out here. <laughs> I know. Catherine, so funny. I, 
when we moved to Oregon, we had to go buy like real winter jackets and I had no same here. And now yeah. they're thin. So it's like, should we just get rid of these? Cause we certainly don't need them here. But I know you had to go probably get a whole new wardrobe. I had like no jackets, like actual jackets that would keep me warm. I, I don't think I had, I had, maybe I had one, maybe for like when I would go up to the mountains, you know, I would have one for that. Like when I would, was living out there and we'd go up to Big Bear or whatever, you know? Yeah. So I would have that, but for regular, like every day, like just keep myself warm. I had like nothing. So yeah, it's funny. It is. And you really, you, you really need it <laughs> or you, you can't go outside, you know? Exactly. Yeah. I so. know. I know. I know. Anyways. It's, it's almost like it's, it had, it flipped, you know, for you, like, cause we, for me, I have more shorts and summer clothes and hardly any winter. But then when we moved up to Oregon, I had to put away those summer clothes and we only had like six weeks of really warm weather, you know? Oh, really? Yeah. Cause we were in Bend. So we were on the East side of the Cascade mountains. So we got a lot of snow. It wasn't like Portland where they get a lot of rain. We got a lot of snow. So um, it was here. Snowing. Oh, go ahead. Oh no. I was just going to say here. It's like, it stays hot for a while. Like the summer months are really hot. So oh. it's like, we, we really get every season here. Like, like the quintessential, you know, season. Yeah. So it, it gets, and it's humid here, which is the, yeah. Yeah. So I, I could have handled organ or bend we lasted six years, but I would have handled it better had we had a little bit longer summer. We really only had um, really warm, I would say like 90s warm, like August and half of July. That was it, probably six mm -hmm. weeks. And then mm -hmm. September back to cold again. And we had snow starting um, somewhere at the end of October. And even like our last year there, we had snow on the last day of school. I, I just couldn't do it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It, it gets depressing. It really does. It affects your mood after a while. Cause you're like, you're stuck inside. And yeah. I mean that we ha finally got like a nice day and literally I think our whole town was outside walking. Like we went, my husband and I went for a walk at this greenway nearby and like it was the middle of a work day and we work at home. So we're able to go out and do that. But I mean, there were so many people out. I'm like, look at us all. We've been like trapped for months. And it's, Get out. I know it just, everyone goes crazy. Like, Oh, the sun is out. Yeah. So yeah, it gets, it gets hard. You can't yeah. beat where you are, the weather where you are. I That's know. for sure. That's why we move back. Yeah. I just couldn't handle it. You know, I don't, I don't blame you. Yep. Yep. So, well, have a All wonderful right. weekend. You too. Bye. I'll see you next week. Okay. I'll see you next week. All right. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.